We're going to look at our Torah portion today. You know, one thing I think we need to really get a hold of when we're doing these Torah portions, what I have in my mind when I'm reading it, I'm not reading words on a piece of paper in a book. In my mind, I am hearing God speaking live on Mount Sinai. You know what I mean? This is, wow, the creator of the universe spoke these words. Uh, you know, I mean, people believe in aliens and UFOs, and I don't care if you do, but talk about someone who's not from this planet visiting Earth, speaking to us. Oh my gosh, we ought to listen to what he has to say. So I don't read this as words on a page. I hear it as God is speaking to me today. Can you tell the difference? I mean, that's huge. That is huge. So here is mishpatim. Do you remember what mishpatim means? Judgments. Now, how do we know it's judgments and not judgment? The S and the team. Yes, the S in English and the team. Now, in Hebrew, there are two three-letter root words, and everything is built around it. Here it is the shin Pei Tet, which is Shaphat. Okay? Now, I'm going to show you something here. There is Shaphat by itself means a judge. If you make it plural, it's Shoftim. You add the Yud and the Mem. That's like adding the S in English. So that is Shoftim. And then if you say judgments in the plural, it is Mish. Team. You just add the mem at the beginning, because if you'll notice, judges is right there in judgments, but adding the mem. So there's all kinds of words going, is it his judgments, your judgments, my judgments? But instead of being two words, they add a letter to the beginning or the end, so you know. But Moses did not use the modern font. Just like on your computer, you have a dozen different fonts. Hebrew was in a different font when Moses used it. And here is how he wrote the word Shaphat. The first letter looks like a W, but what does it represent? Do you remember? Fangs, teeth. It's like you can see these two fangs. And that means the, the letter Shin means to consume, like with your teeth, or to devour which is why fire has the shin in it, because it's a strong devourer, okay? The pay represents what? The mouth, pay, okay, that's your mouth. And the tet represents the circle with an X, which is the serpent. So what does the judge do? He destroys the mouth of the serpent. That's what the ancient Hebrew is telling us what a judge does. Isn't that fascinating? Now, Here's something that's very important. There are four type of commandments or laws, and I'm showing you the singular and I'm showing you the plural. So in the English, going down, you can see a commandment, a judgment or an ordinance, a statute or law or instruction. What is the difference between those? We often think of them all the same. They're all different. So in Hebrew, the word for commandment is a mitzvah. Va, okay, and you can see here, this is the M, the TZ, the V, and the H, mitzvah, okay? So that is a singular commandment, and then in the plural, it's a mitzvot. Do you see the same letters are in it? The only difference is the last letter from a he, it goes to a tav. That's what makes it from singular to plural, and so then you have what we're studying now, mishpat, and the mishpatim. And then the statute is a, depends if it's masculine or feminine here, uh, because in Hebrew they have masculine and feminine words, but it's not chuck. <laughs> it's chut, hook, a hook and a chukot, or plural, chukim. And then, of course, instruction, law really isn't the right word, it's instruction. Torah means what? instruction, all right? And in the plural, it is torot. And you can see the letter hey changes to a uh, tav again. 
Do you remember in, I think it's 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and proper for instruction. The New Testament is Torah. It's instruction. See, this is why when we think of law, the one thing mankind does is wants to rebel against law. You ain't the boss of me. And so that's why they want to rebel against even God's laws. But they have to realize, think of the Torah as the operation manual for your car. That's what it is. It's an instruction how to take care of your car. You follow the operations manual. If you don't want to take care of your car, don't put any oil in it. Okay. Well, the whole purpose isn't a law. You have to put oil in your car. No, it's just saying it's a really good idea. Okay. And then we don't put oil in the car and then we wonder, you know, God, why did you do this to me? <laughs> like God says, don't put your hand in a blender. And then we put our hand in a blender and wondering, God, why did you do that to me? Okay. So we have to understand the Torah is instruction in righteousness. It tells us how to live. So let's start with Exodus 21, 1, our first verse. Now, these are the mishpatim. And then it says, which you shall set before them. What does that word set? When you hear the word set before them, what are you thinking of? Just to tell them, okay, this is it. No, the word set implies like you're setting a table with all these beautiful things. And so it's, it's not, these are the laws you're to cram down their throats. No, these are the, the, my judgments that I want you to set them out like a prepared table that they can come and eat at, like at Passover, okay? And it's a buffet. And all of a sudden you see what's under there and what is it? Your Torah, it's a five course meal. There's all kinds of things. God is setting them before us. So it's not, this is what's important. There's a lot of Torah teachers that are into law, judgment, this kind of a thing, both in Judaism as well as out of Judaism. But it's not enough to just teach the Torah. We have to present it like a set table from which one is ready to eat. You don't cram the Torah down someone's throat. You put it out like a buffet and let them partake. But here's the, one of the most important things. Every law okay, is a piece of godliness. That's what it is. Every law is a small revelation of the lawgiver. So not only do we teach the Torah, we have to explain the reasons for the commandments as well. But the law or the Torah is more than just rules for governing human behavior. What are they? The laws of the Torah are more than governing human behavior. Why did God give us the law? It was a reflection of him. When you look at our government's laws, they are reflections of our government. Do you see what I mean? Look at the border policies. Look at all of their policy of running up the debt. Look at all their policies. The laws are a reflection of your government. And so we have to, when we're reading the Torah, we need to look at it as we read it. What does this tell me about God? We need to know God and we need to make him known. And we need to show how he's a loving God, but he also is a God that's a parent that wants to make sure we behave for our sake. He doesn't need it. It's for our sake. Okay, so... They are God's. When you read the Torah, you have to realize it is God's self-disclosure. He's saying, here's who I am. So when we're reading the Torah, we're listening to what he's telling us more than just so we know what to do, but we want to know what he's like. Does that make sense? This is incredible. When this is realized, we see the enormous gravity of declaring the Torah is now null and void. Wow. Wow. To study God's commands is the very study of God himself. And when we begin to discard commandments, we have become God's superior and feel we have the authority to edit his work. That's pretty scary. We begin to take on Satan's role saying, has God really said this? Or is this what he really meant? We've begun a process of reshaping God into our image that we feel is much more appropriate. 
So when we try to edit the Torah or do away with the commandments, it's actually God we are trying to change or do away with. I mean, this is, this, uh, is what replacement theology has done. This is why replacement theology is so bad. Genesis 26.5, listen to this. When did the Torah come into existence? Let me ask you this. When did the Torah come into existence? Moses wrote what we see as the Torah so we could have a hard copy. <laughs> okay. But when did the Torah come into existence? In Adam. Look at Genesis 26.5. Now, Abraham was like 400 years before Moses, 400 years before Moses. And it says in Genesis 26, 5, that Abraham obeyed my voice. He kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, my laws. He's saying everything that I showed you up there on the chart, my commandments, my statutes, my, large, uh, my laws, Abraham kept all of them. Now, Look at this. Uh, I want you to know English is not the best translation of the Bible, and I'm going to prove it to you. And for those who are King James only, I'm sorry. Okay. Look at Deuteronomy 8.1. It says, all the commandments which I command you this day shall you observe to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. All the commandments. But look at Deuteronomy 8.1 in another translation. All the commandment, singular, which I command you this day shall you observe to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers. Okay, now wait a minute. One says mitzvah, the other one says mitzvot. Remember the, what I showed you? Okay, mitzvah ending in a hey is singular, and mitzvot ending with the tov is plural. And now that you know Hebrew, you can go back and see which is correct. All right, so here we go. Here's Genesis 26, 5. Abraham kept my commandments. Notice it's plural. The letter yud that you see there is my commandments. By adding a letter to you, it becomes my. So you can see commandments is in the plural with the tov. Now in Deuteronomy 8.1, you had the hey, which is the. Oops, sorry. And so what do you see here? It is the commandment. It is singular. So the correct translation is the second version that says you may all the commandment. Now, in our English, we think, well, all would seem plural, but it's not. And so this is the explanation. You can't divide it up. It's one whole piece like a quilt. You can't be pulling out commandments. And when you say commandments, you think of all these individual ones, and this one's done away with, this one will keep, this one's done away with, this one will keep. God says you have to keep the whole thing. You can't be pulling out commandments that are done away with that you think, are you following me? It's, it's all. It's a... It's a big singular package. But now that you're learning Hebrew, you can look at the Hebrew and see that commandment is correct, not commandments. But our English translators like to pick and choose how they're going to translate depending on their theology. All right, moving on. But I think that's important for people to understand. Now, Let's go back a minute concerning Passover. If you go back to Exodus 12, 20 through, 24 through 27, it says you're to observe. Oh, that reminds me of something else. Now, I talked about this last week, but some of you may not have been here last week. How many English translations do we have of the Bible or versions? But there's only one Hebrew. You would think they, someone else would come up with it. No, they can't change one jot, one tittle. That's why Hebrew is what you want to try to learn or study because you don't have all these different nonsense versions. There's only one. There's only ever been one. Okay, it says, you shall observe Passover for an ordinance to you and to your sons forever. That's a long time. It'll happen when you come into the land which the Lord is going to give you according as he has promised. 
I want you to keep this service. And it will happen when your children ask you, what do you mean by this service? When you read that, they're acting like this service is a burden. This is coming across like, oh, what do you mean by this? You know, why should I dump the trash? Why should I do this? Why should I do that? Okay, so you got to explain to them. And you're to say, this is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of, in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, spared our houses, and the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Okay, so it's important that, and there's four different children, and there's four different answers, depending on the type of child, how you respond when they want to know about this. But here's the other thing. Our civil laws, how do you know our civil laws are pretty absurd here in the United States? In a lot of different ways. And so God is the one who determines our civil laws. That's our yardstick, okay? So that's why we need to understand God's thinking, why he did things. Now look at this in Exodus 21.16. Whoever steals a person and then sells them, and anyone found in possession of them shall be what? Put to death. Look at all the human trafficking that's going on. In the United States, it is horrible right here in the United States, which is one of the main reasons God's going to be judging the United States. Let's look at Exodus 21, 18 and 19. If you're in a fight... Okay, and someone gives another one a blow with a stone or with his fist, but he doesn't die. But it makes him have to stay in bed. If he's able to get up again and go about with a cane or a stick, the other one will be let off. Only he still has to give payment for the loss of the man's time and see that he's taken care for until he is well. Now, let me ask you something. In the Ten Commandments, is there anything ruling whether you hit someone with your fist? If they don't die, I mean, so do we say, okay, uh, that's done away with. I can now hit you with a rock. As long as you don't die, I'm good. Well, that's not one of the Ten Commandments. I thought it's all done away with the Ten Commandments. Whoa. Well, wait a minute here. So in the Torah, we find that's not done away with. Why would the Bible tell us that he must pay the medical bills also if we were meant to only rely upon God and not go to a doctor? The Bible wouldn't say, go see a doctor if we weren't supposed to go see a doctor. Okay, but we have to take care of the medical things. A lot of people, you know, they'll say, well, the Bible says eye for an eye, so he can go punch him in the face now. No, that's not what it meant. It meant you have to remedy the situation. Like if you run into someone's car, you can't just say you're sorry. You got to pay for the car. Okay, that's a Torah principle. That's not something that's done away with. Look at Exodus 21, 33 through 36. If a man, you know, opens a pit or digs a big hole in his yard, or if a man will dig a pit and then not cover it, and then an ox or a donkey falls in there, the owner of the pit has to make it good and give money to the owner. And then the dead beast will be his. And if one's ox hurt another's that he dies, then he has to sell the live ox and divide the money. And the dead ox also there to divide. Or if it be known that the ox is used to push the times past and his owner has not kept him in, he will surely pay ox for ox and the dead uh, will be his own. Okay. Are we going, this is like if a dog comes and bites somebody and it's known that the dog has bitten people before and they haven't reigned them in, there's greater consequences. Can we say, no, that's done away with now? How can you say that these are God telling us how we're to treat situations? You don't have, okay, now my dog gets to go bite you. That's, that's not what the Bible means when it says eye for eye, tooth for tooth. It means measure for measure. If you injure something or do something stupid, you got to pay for the damage. Now, do we say that principle is done away with? I don't think so. Uh, look at Exodus 22, verse 1. If someone steals an ox or a sheep and then he kills it or sells it, he has to restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. 
Can you imagine how stealing would stop if all of a sudden they had to pay five times and four times? Think about what that would do to our prison system. If, you, if there was serious consequences that made a difference. Exodus 22, verse 2 through 6. If a thief is found breaking up and he's smitten that he dies, there will no blood be shed for him. But if the sun is risen, there shall be blood shed. For he should make full restitution. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for a theft, which means he has to go work it off. If the theft certainly be found in his hand alive, whether it's an ox or a donkey, a sheep, he has to do what? Restore double. And if a man cause a field or a vineyard to be eaten and put in his beast and will feed in another man's field or the best of his field, what does it say? Then one of the best of his own vineyard shall he make restitution. And if fire break out and catch in thorns so that the stacks of corn or the standing corn of the field be consumed, he that kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. Okay? So what the Bible, what these laws are about is equal measures. You have to determine how much money it costs to do that. It's not that he gets to go burn your field now. Okay? That everyone misunderstands the eye for eye, tooth for tooth. It means equal measures. You have to pay equally as determined by the judge to repay what happened. Now, how many of you know, even though God says don't steal, people still steal. Okay, just because God said don't do it doesn't mean that, okay, we won't, we understand. You're going to have people who steal. They owe money. They must work for others to pay off the debt or for the money that they've swindled. But when the problems and injustices of life are dealt with in a Torah way, then we're getting so much closer to perfection. The problem is it's not being dealt with in a Torah way today. Look at Ephesians 4.28. Let him that stole quit it, but rather let him go to work, working with his hands that which is good that he may have to give him that needs. Someone who steals, it's all about them. They don't care about the other person. But now the mind has to change so that he can give to one that needs. It's no longer about him. That's what true salvation is. I can't I'll tell you how important that is. People think just because say they say the magic words of Jesus, Jesus three times, spin around, click their heels, now they can sin all they want. Okay, that is so absurd. The, the thing is, what true salvation is, is you're no longer living for yourself in everything you do. It's now you're not living for yourself, you're living for God in everything that you do. Because it's not about me, it's about him. It's a mindset change. If I serve God only because I don't want to go to hell, it's still about me. If I'm serving God only because I want to go to heaven, it's still about me. The thing that revolutionized my life when I was 19 years old, when I got saved, uh, really what happened was I was starting to turn. I don't think I was really saved yet, but I don't believe I was going to die until I got saved. All of a sudden, I realized... In Genesis 6, it says that repented the Lord that he made man and it grieved him at his heart. That implies difficulty in breathing as if God was sobbing because everything he wanted was being destroyed. And all of a sudden I realized, just like Joseph, you know, when Pharaoh's wife was coming after him, he says, I can't do this and sin against God. He didn't say, I can't do this and if I get caught, look what happens. So I decided I was going to serve God, not out of fear of punishment, not out of hope of reward, but because I don't want to break his heart. You're less likely to sin against someone you love than just a master. This is why the whole true salvation is your whole mindset changes. I'm, it's no longer about me. And then life becomes so much fun because when it's all about you, you live in a very small world. Okay. Let's go to uh, Luke 19.8. Do you remember the story of Zacchaeus? And he said to the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I'm going to give to the poor, and if I have taken anything for anyone by false accusation, I will restore him what? Okay, he's following the Torah. Look at Exodus twenty-two fourteen. If you borrow something from your neighbor, and then it is injured or dies, the owner not being with it, he has to do what? Make full restitution. So if you borrow tools from your neighbor, and then all of a sudden that neighbor loses it, he's got to pay for it. 
Now, what if he comes, let's say someone borrows your riding lawnmower, okay? And then you go to get it back from them and it's gone. It got stolen from that person's house. All right, well, does that person say, well, I'm not under the law. I don't have to pay for that. I'm not under the law. The Torah's done away with. What? Or one of the laws in the Torah is employers have to pay their employees on payday. That's a law in the Torah. Okay. So what would you say if on payday, your employer says, I'm not under the law. I don't have to pay you today. I'll pay you next week. What? Well, that's not in the Ten Commandments. No one in the Ten Commandments does it say you have to pay your employees on payday. That's why there's not 10 commandments, there's 613. When you look at everything God says. Okay, now, oh, this next one is so scary. And English does, is no good. It says here, Exodus 22, 22 through 24. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. Now, was that in the 10 commandments? No. Well, I can now afflict widows because I'm not under the law. All right. Listen to this. If you afflict them in any way and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will wax hot and I will kill you with the sword. And then your wives will be widows and your children fatherless. But you want to hear it in the Hebrew, correct translation back into the English? If mistreating, you mistreat them and cry, they cry to me, listen, I will listen to them. It's a double. It's, it's like, you know, you're in big trouble. Why? Because the orphan and the widow can't defend themselves. They can't defend. So God becomes their defender. Look at Exodus 22, 26, and 27. If you at all take your neighbor's raiment to pledge, you have to give it to him when the sun goes down because that's his covering. It's his raiment for his skin. Wherein shall he sleep? And it will come to pass when he cries to me that I will hear for I am gracious. There's a big difference in the Hebrew where he says I am gracious. It doesn't mean I do gracious things. It means that's who I am. That's my entity. That's my name is gracious. In other words, being gracious isn't just an act, but it's an integral part of who God is. Oh, how many of you have ever heard of this term, fake news? Did you know that's not in the Torah? But listen to this. In Exodus 23, 1 and 2, you will not spread a false report. Don't join your hand with the wicked to be a malicious witness. And then it says, you shall not follow a crowd to do evil. Neither shall you testify in court to side with a multitude to pervert justice. Okay, when it, uh, are we a democracy? Okay, do you know what the church of Laodicea, which was the church that was asleep, Right? Do you know what Laodicea means? Democracy. It means let the people decide. In other words, who's ever in the majority is right. So if the majority says prostitution is okay, well, then prostitution is okay. If the majority says abortion is okay, well, that's what the majority says. That's not what this says, though. This says here, you're not to follow the multitude to do evil. Okay? So here's the... the biblical Torah rule. The rule of following the majority is relevant only when you don't know for sure what the truth is, when there is an unresolved doubt. But when there is no doubt, no amount of people with their opinions will change the truth. You following? Okay, this is why in these last days, they're trying to make good evil and evil good, and they're turning everything on its head. Illegal doesn't mean illegal. They're changing the terms. And so we need to know the truth and not just side with the majority. Exodus 23, 7, keep far away from a false matter. Okay, 
uh, Exodus 23, 8, you shall not take a bribe for a bribe blinds those who have sight and perverts the words of the righteous. Oh, is there any commandment in the 10 commandments that say don't take a bribe? No. So is that done away with now? So politicians can take bribes, judges can take bribes. It's not in the Torah. It's done away with. This is where Christians have to understand they're bringing all of these things upon ourselves by saying it's done away with. So here's the 10 commandments. All right. Does it say you can take bribes? No. Does it say anything against throwing rocks? <laughs> no. Uh, does it say you can be a mean to widow now? Okay. What about being selfish? That's not in the 10 commandments. Okay. This is why we have to understand the whole thing. Am I late? I got about four minutes. Okay. Exodus, oh uh, yeah, 23, 10, 11. This is talking about the Shemitah year. It says six years, you're to sow your land and gather in the fruits, but the seventh year, let it rest so that the poor of your people may eat and what they leave, the beasts of the field shall eat. What is that telling you? It's not about you. It's not your land. It's God's land that you're taking care of. In like manner, you're to deal with your vineyard and with your olive groves. Okay, verse 14 through 17. Three times in the year, you're to keep a feast. Does anyone remember what they are? Passover, Pentecost, tabernacles. Okay, and it says, no one shall appear before me empty-handed. You're to keep the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labor, of what you sow in the field. You shall keep the feast of in gathering, that's tabernacles, at the end of the year. And then it says, when you gather in from the field of fruit of your labor, three times in the year shall all your bales appear before the Lord. Now, I want you to notice the Feast of Tabernacles is in what month? September, October, depending, you know, because it's not based on our calendar. But notice September, October is called the end of the year. In the Torah, a lot of people say, no, sir, Nisan is the beginning of the year and the end of the year. Guess what? There's two calendars. There's a religious calendar, which does begin on Nisan 1, and there's a civil calendar, which is the end of the year, which begins on Tishri 1. So you have to understand there's more than one calendar. Now, Exodus 23, 19, do not seethe a kid in his mother's milk. And what does that mean? Don't eat a cheeseburger. No, I'm kidding. That's, what, that's the verse the Jews use to not eat cheeseburgers. But um, Abraham fed the angels that came to him uh, meat and milk. But anyway, the principle here is don't be mean to animals. The very substance that gave the animal life, its mother's milk, shouldn't be used to take its life at the moment of its death. Okay, so the, again, why, why is God saying this? Now look at Exodus 23, verse 20 and 21. How many of you know that in the New Testament, uh, Yeshua's disciples were called followers of the way. Where does that come from? <gasps> Exodus 23, 20 and 21. Behold, I'm going to send an, a messenger before you to keep you in the way and to bring you to the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not <clears throat> pardon your transgressions, <clears throat> for my name is in him. Okay, let me explain this. Yeshua, God's messenger, has gone before us. He also said, I am the way. And he also said, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. Like the bridegroom goes away from the bride after the betrothal to prepare, okay, the hupa for the wedding in his father's house. But the thing about this messenger, this messenger has the ability to forgive sin, which no angel has the authority to do. So we know this is talking about Yeshua. And it also doesn't say this messenger is coming in my name or my name is on him, but my name is in him. This is huge. Exodus 23, 22, it says, if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. Who want God to be on your side? Then it says you better obey his voice and do all that not he says, but I say. Which is why Yeshua said, I'm only telling you what the Father tells me. That's why you see the difference in pronouns. Now, look at Exodus 23, 25, and 27. It says, you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from among you. No one will miscarry or be barren. I'll fulfill the number of your days. 
I will send my terror before you and will throw into confusion all the people against whom you will come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. Okay, Israel hasn't been doing that, which is why they're going through what they're going through. Uh, let's see, let's go down to Exodus 24, the next, skip a verse here. And so Moses, he said, come up to the Lord, you, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders, and worship afar off. And Moses alone will come near the Lord, but they won't come near, neither shall the people go up. So it says, Moses came, told the people all the words of the Lord, and all of the what? Which is what in Hebrew? Mishpatim, Okay. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, we do. That's the marriage ceremony. And they say, I do, when they're going through all of the things. This is where they entered a betrothal with the Lord. Now, here comes a test. Are you ready for a quiz? All right, here's the quiz. Don't look at your notes. You gotta look up here. What came first? God gave the Moses the stone tablets or God wrote the commandments in or Moses. Did God give Moses the stone tablets and then Moses wrote them in a book or did Moses write them in the book and then God gave him the 10 commandments? Well, did the stone tablets come first or did the book come first? How many believe the book? How many believe this on tablets? How many are clueless? <laughs> I didn't see anybody, a lot of people didn't raise their hand. Okay. <laughs> Look at Exodus 24, four through eight. Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. Then he rose up early. He built an altar. He made 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes. He sent young men that offered burnt offerings, sacrificed peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half the blood, put it in basins, half the blood he sprinkles on the altar, and then he also takes half the blood and sprinkles it on everybody. And then it says this, and he took the book of the covenant and read it to everybody. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And so Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. So here we see he has written everything in a book. He read it to everybody. And then look what happens in the next verses. Now the Lord tells Moses, why don't you come up into the mount and be there and I will give you tablets of stone. So before the tablets of stone were ever put down, Moses, and this is why Aaron was so accountable making the golden calf. All they had to do was look at the book. Okay, uh, Exodus 24, 16 and 17. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for how many days? Six days, 6,000 years. A day of the Lord, 6,000 years, six days. And the seventh day, Yeshua was going to call us out of the midst of the cloud. <laughs> and the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Amen and amen. Hope you learned a little bit more about Torah today. Let's stand. Avinu Mokainu, a Father King, we just thank you so much for all of the lights that are here in this room and online, all of the United States, all of the world. We thank you so much for everyone who is committed to being a light, which basically means they're going to follow your commandments, your laws, your statutes, your judgments. I thank you for every single one of them that also uh, either tithe or do offerings into uh, your ministry here at El Shaddai because the time is so short and we want to spread the light of your Torah, not for our sake. We don't want to be selfish. We want to do this because we want to see you get all the glory in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Okay, well now we're going to dig a little deeper in the Gospels. Are you ready? Let's start digging. We're going to start digging. 
I got my little digger right here, digging into the Gospels. Okay, here's the thing. Ezra and Nehemiah built the temple, right? After Solomon's temple was destroyed, after the 70 year captivity, they come back from Babylon. Ezra, Nehemiah built the temple. And how long did it take for them to build? 20 years, 20 years. And then it lasted about 350 years. Okay, that's how long that lasted. And so Herod's temple really was the third temple, not the second temple, if you think about it, because Ezra and Nehemiah built one. Okay, now Ezra and Nehemiah's temple is the one that was defiled by the Hanukkah story in 168, with the whole story of the Maccabees. Okay, that's the one that was defiled. So now, here we are, and we have Herod's temple, that picture up there during Yeshua's time. And listen, we're going to start with Mark 13, verse 1 and 2. He was going out of the temple, and one of his disciples said to him, Master, see what stones and what buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There's not one stone here resting on another which will not be overturned. Wow. Sometimes we get all excited about the outside, realizing the outside isn't going to last I don't know if you knew this, but historically, they began building the temple about 19 BC. 19 BC is when Herod began building it. And then it was basically completed by 26 CE or 26 AD. Most of it, believe it or not, was built in the first five years of the 40 years. If you look at uh, John 2.20 on your notes, Then said the Jews, 46 years was this temple in building, and you're going to raise it up in three days? So this tells you the temple took 46 years to build. And you go from 26 AD, you can go back to 19 BC, and that gives you about the exact timing of the temple. Now, why did Herod build the temple? Does anybody know historically why? I'm going to tell you historically why. Herod was full of wrath over the fact that the rabbis would not acknowledge him as a valid king because he was Edomite, okay? Therefore, he arose and he killed Every one of the rabbis except one, who was his personal counselor. Does anyone remember this man's name? You will never forget it. It is Bava ben Buta. Bava, son of Buta. Now, before we look at those verses underneath, I want to tell you the story. What did he do to all the rabbis? He killed every one of them. And then Herod took Bava ben Buta, the only one he trusted, and poked out his eyes. And then he placed on his head a garland of thorns. And one day, <clears throat> Herod came out to Bava ben Buta, but he changed his voice. Bava ben Buta can't see. So he doesn't know who's sitting down next to him. So Herod disguises his voice and he said, do you see, sir, what this wicked slave Herod does? And Bava Bed Buddha replied, well, what do you want me to do to him? And Herod said, I want you to curse him. But Bava Bed Buddha replied with the verse, even in your thoughts, you should not curse a king. He quotes Ecclesiastes 10.20. And so what does Herod do then? Herod said, but Herod is no king. And Bava Ben Buddha replied, well, even though he be only a rich man, it is written, and in your bedchamber, do not curse the rich. (sighs) And so now, what does Herod do? He says, but, uh, and then, and then Baba Ben Buddha said this. He said, well, not only that, 
be he no more than a prince. It is written, a prince among your people, you shall not curse, which is from here. So he's just quoting scripture to Herod. So Herod says, but this only applies to one who acts as one of your people, but Herod does not act as one of your people. And so Baba ben Buddha said, but I'm afraid of him. And Herod said to him, but there's nobody who can go and tell him since we too are quite alone. He replied, it is written, for a bird of the heaven will carry the voice and that which has wings shall tell of the matter. Going back to this verse. Okay, so th this is what is going, this, this whole conversation is over this verse. Or, you know, Herod's trying to get him to say something. And then Herod said, I'm Herod. And had I known that you rabbis were so circumspect, I would not have killed them all. Now tell me what amends I can make. And Baba Ben Buddha replied, just as you have extinguished the light of the world by killing all the rabbis, as it is written from Proverbs 6.23, the commandment is a light and the Torah is a lamp. So Baba Ben Buddha said, you go now and attend to the light of the world, which is the temple, as it is written, and all the nations become enlightened by it from Isaiah 2.2. That's why Herod began to build the temple, because he had killed all these rabbis, but one who answered him correctly and not bad-mouthing Herod, or he would have been killed. And now that is why Herod began to build the temple in 19 BC. So now you know the rest of the story. Okay, so now we go to Mark 13, 14 and 15. What do we see? It says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Okay, so he, this is Yeshua's day. Daniel was like 400 years earlier. And it says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, standing where it shouldn't be, let him that reads understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains and let him that is on the housetop, don't go down to the house, don't even enter there to take anything out of his house. Now, Here's what's amazing. That was already fulfilled 168 years earlier during Hanukkah. You have Daniel, a couple hundred years later, you got Hanukkah, a couple hundred years later, you have Yeshua. So what the disciples are thinking, wow, what happened 200 years ago is going to happen again. You follow me? History repeats itself. It cycles. So we saw an abomination of desolation put where it was. That happened during Daniel's time or during uh, Hanukkah. And what did they do? They fled to the mountains. And those that were in the housetop had to leave quickly, not take anything out of the house. So let's look at 1 Maccabees 2, 27 and 28. What happens? This was 200 years earlier. Mattathias cried throughout the city with a loud voice saying, whoever is zealous of the law and maintains the covenant, let him follow me. So he and his sons, what did they do? They fled to the mountains and they left all that they ever had in the city. And so you have to understand Hanukkah is going to repeat itself. And that's what's coming to a planet near you very soon. It's not too many Christians have a Greek mindset. Checklist done. Won't happen again. It's just the opposite. It's happened. It will happen again. God said there's nothing new under the sun. Everything that's happened is what's going to happen. The only thing is there's a different cast of characters on the planet. But the events happen again. They repeat themselves. And then look at this, Mark 13, 16 through 18. Let him that's in the field don't turn back again to take up his garment, but woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days and pray that your flight not be in winter. When's Hanukkah? In winter. And why does it say woe to them that are with child? Look what happens 168 years before Messiah at Hanukkah. It was the 15th day of Kislev, in the 145th year, they set up the abomination of desolation. That's Daniel. This is a prophecy of Daniel 200 years later being fulfilled 200 years before Messiah. And they built idol altars throughout the cities of Judah on every side and burned incense at the doors of their own homes and in the streets. And when they had written in pieces the Torah, which they found, they burnt the Torah in the fire. And whoever was found with any books, any books of the Tanakh, 
or if any committed were committed to the Torah, the king's commandment was they should put them to death. Thus did they by their authority unto the Israelites every month to as many as were found in the cities. And then on the 25th day of the month, when's Hanukkah? The 25th day of Kislev. So this is how Hanukkah began. They sacrificed, you know, a pig upon the idol altar, which was upon the altar of God in Jerusalem. At which time, according to the commandment, they put to death women. And then they had those Israeli women who allowed their children to be circumcised, they hanged the kids around the mother's neck and rifled their houses and slew those that had circumcised them. Howbeit, many in Israel were fully resolved to confirm to themselves not to eat any unclean thing. Wherefore, the rather to die that they might not be defiled with meats and that they might not profane the Holy Covenant. So they died. And there was a very great wrath upon Israel. Wow, this is Hamas, violence, what they're doing. So let's go back to Mark 13, 24 through 26. It says, in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon won't give her light, and the stars of heaven will fall, and the powers that are in heaven will be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. How many of you would like to be alive to see that? Man. Well, this comes from Isaiah. Like I always say, there's nothing new in the New Testament. It's just more commentary on what happened in the Tanakh. Isaiah 13, 6 through 10. How ye for the day of the Lord is at hand. It's going to come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be faint. Every man's heart will melt and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman that travails. They'll be amazed one at another. Their faces will be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. He will destroy the sinners out of it. And then here we go. The stars of heaven, the constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened and is going forth, and the moon will not cause her light to shine. So this is where Mark got this from. Now, look at Mark 14, 12 through 15, it was the first day of unleavened bread and they killed the Passover. So Passover isn't a day, Passover is a lamb and they killed the lamb. And his disciples said to him, uh, where do you want us to go to prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent forth two of his disciples and he said to them, go to the city and there you meet a young man bearing a pitcher of water, follow him and wherever he goes, Say to the good man of the house, the master says, where's the guest chamber where I can eat the Passover with my disciples? And then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared. And that's where I want you to make ready. Okay, so here they are, verse 22 through 26. They're eating the Passover. And Yeshua, having taken bread and blessed and broke it, and he gave it to them. And he said, take and eat. This is my body. Now, uh, this isn't the Catholic idea transubstantiation and the bread miraculously turns into his flesh and they eat his flesh because you're not supposed to eat people. Okay. Having taken the cup and giving thanks, he gave it to them and drank it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant. In both these, his body and his blood refers to his death. Okay. His death is symbolizing a new covenant that's being made which for many is being poured out. Verily I say to you that no more will I drink of the produce of the vine till that day when I may drink it new in the reign of God. And then it says, having sung a hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives. Who knows the words to the song that they sang? It was Psalms 118, because Psalm 118 is the last hymn every Passover. So if you want to know the words to the song, to that hymn, just go to Psalm 118. And it's amazing. And I've taught on that many times. I don't have time to go into that right now. But that's the hymn that they sang. Now, let's take a look at the new covenant that Mark was talking about. In Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 33. 
Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make what? A new covenant. And who's it with? The Gentiles. No, it's not with the Gentiles. It's with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The New Testament is not the new covenant. The New Testament is about the new covenant. Okay? And look, it's not going to be according to the covenant that I made earlier with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, <clears throat> which my covenant they broke, although I was their husband. See, that is when they got engaged, betrothed on Shavuot. The marriage takes place on Tishri 1, Rosh Hashanah, but this is when they were betrothed. And it says, but this is going to be the covenant that I will make with who? The house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I'm going to put my Torah in their inward parts. I'm going to write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Okay, let's take a look at the pictures. Here we go. This is the covenant that they broke. Okay, and the Ten Commandments were busted because they were worshiping the golden calf. And they had the book they could have seen. Don't do the golden calf. So they knew better and they broke it. And so what did God do? I'm not going to make it this time on stone tablets. I'm going to put it in their heart. So the law wasn't done away with. The law was relocated. It went from external. How many of you know, anytime someone tells you to do something and it's external, we fight against it. So what does the new covenant is? He puts it in our heart. So we want to do it. That's the difference. Wow. It's like your teenager. They don't want to dump the trash and they rebel or whatever. And then all of a sudden something happens and now they want to do it. It's not that, okay, you don't have to dump the trash anymore. Or now if you don't, you can get away with it. We want to fulfill God's laws. It's, we don't want to get rid of them. We want to know how we can help mom and dad or how we can help our neighbor because we want to, not because we have to. That's the only thing that happened. That's the only thing. The law didn't change. We change. The fault, when you read in Hebrews, it says the fault was with them. It wasn't with the law. The fault is with us. Because just like a little kid, they hate the chain link fence that won't allow them to go play in the street. But the parents love the chain link fence that protects the kids from going into the street. And then what happens, the kid gets older, and he has kids, and then he loves the fence. What changed? Not the fence, but that person's attitude. I hope that makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> then it says in Daniel 7, 13 and 14, he sees in the night visions, and there was one like the son of man who was coming with the clouds of heaven. This is in Daniel. He sees the return of the Messiah. <clears throat> and the son of man came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him and there was given him dominion and a glory and a kingdom so that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will never pass away and his kingdom will never be destroyed. So where does Mark get that? Mark gets that from Daniel. It says in 61 through 64, Mark 14, he held his peace and he answered nothing. Again, the high priest said to him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed? And Yeshua said, well, you're going to see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power and coming where? In the clouds of heaven. Yeshua got that from the book of Daniel because he's the one who told Daniel to write it. And then what did the high priest do? He rent his clothes and he said, what need we any further of witnesses. You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. Okay. Look at John 18, 31 and 32. They take him to Pilate and Pilate says to them, take him yourselves and let him be judged by your own law. But the Jews said to him, we have no right to put any man to death that the words of Jesus might come true pointing to the sort of death he would have. Why did the Jews say that they have no right to put anyone to death? What? Well, no, because they killed people all the time, the Jews did. 
for disobeying the Torah. They were even going to stone the adulterous woman. They had no problem killing people. So let me tell you the rest of the story. Okay, here we go. Here is a picture of the temple. On the north side is what is called the chamber of the hewn stone. Here's what it looks on the outside. This is on the north side of the temple faced east. This is on the north side. Here's what the inside looked like, basically. And let me see. I'm going to read to you, and I'll show anyone the book. As you can see, I've got all kinds of tabs in here. I love this book. And if you want to get this book, I, this is a book I'd recommend on Amazon or whatever. But it's the history of the Jewish people during the time of the Messiah. Now, this is written by an Orthodox Jewish author, okay? This is the art scroll. But it's great to hear their perspective. Everyone has a different perspective. But I want you to hear some of these things that were absolutely amazing. This is the section on why they couldn't kill Yeshua. Okay? <clears throat> it says, um, let me see where I want to start. One of the things they say that happened 40 years before the temple was destroyed, it says the great Sanhedrin left the chamber of the hewn stone and exiled its place somewhere on the outside of the temple area. What that means is like, for example, Sumner cannot execute somebody. It's got to go to a higher court, okay? The state court, or let's say the federal court. The fact that the great Sanhedrin left the chamber of the hewn stone, there was no one who had the authority to convict someone to die. The fact that they were stoning adulterous women and stoning other people says chaos was reigning. Not that they were allowed. It was total chaos that was going on. Now, listen to this. Only when the Sanhedrin sat in the temple area did other courts have the right to try capital cases. And then it says 40 years before the destruction of the temple, which is 30 AD, which is when Yeshua died, they go, the rich, listen to this, the rich, think of deep state too, and those with money, the rich, the aggressive, and even some high priest. Herod appointed like three or four high priests. It wasn't just one. They began, the high priests began to engage gangs of robbers and murderers to tyrannize the people and enrich themselves with the loot of the weak and the poor when they came for the festivals. These evil doers, now this is Jews talking about Jews. These evil doers are the ones who acquired Roman citizenship. And so they enjoyed the support of the procurators while they're doing all these evil things. Consequently, the Jewish courts were powerless to prosecute. How do you prosecute the president? Or how do you prosecute the judge? How, the, you know, how do you prosecute the evil doers because they're an authority? Faced with a situation in which they could not enforce the law, the Sanhedrin said it is better not to try them at all rather than to sentence them according to the law without being able to carry out the law. And then listen to what this says. These events mentioned above occurred during the rule of Pontius Pilate. Okay. Uh, but there's a whole bunch more in here that's just phenomenal. But here's, here's the thing. Let me put this up. Because they left the hewn stone, capital cases could not be tried. <laughs> Trials could not be held on Sabbaths. A guilty verdict couldn't be declared. False witnesses were to be dismissed. Defense lawyer always was appointed. The accused can't incriminate themselves. And a warning has to be issued. That's when capital cases took place. Well, the Sanhedrin couldn't try capital cases outside of their regular meeting place on the Temple Mount. And yet here in Yeshua's trial, the judges assembled in a private house. No trials could be held on the Sabbath or feast days or on the evening before a festival. And yet Yeshua was tried on the Sabbath 
on a festival. A guilty verdict could not be declared the same day as the trial, yet here a verdict was declared within a few hours. Conflicting testimony of false witnesses had to be dismissed, yet here the witnesses' testimony doesn't agree, but the trial still goes on. A defense lawyer was always appointed to defend the accused, yet Yeshua did not, was not allowed a defense lawyer. The accused was not allowed to incriminate himself, yet here the accused's own words in court were the basis for the verdict that they had. The offender was to have been verbally warned by two witnesses that the deed he was about to commit was a crime before he could stand trial, and at most, the counsel should have issued a warning and dismissed him. A charge of blasphemy, which often rested upon a misuse of the tetragrammaton or a misuse of the name of God, could not be leveled against Yeshua here, okay? And then what do we see happens? In Mark 14, 63 and 64, what did the high priest do? He rent his clothes. And he says, what do we need further witnesses for? You heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. And yet look at Leviticus 21.10. Whoever is the high priest upon whose head the anointing oil was poured that is consecrated to put on the garments shall not uncover his head or rent his clothes. They were doing everything out of the line of Torah. Okay, now, here comes the next one. We're going through Mark 14 today of the Gospels. This is what we're doing is digging deeper. Look at Mark 14, 72. The second time, the cock crew. And Peter called to mind the word that Yeshua said to him before the cock crowed twice. Then you will deny me three times. And when he thought they're wrong, he wept. Okay, at the PowerPoints. Here we go. Many people think, that the rooster that was crowing cock a doodle do is what happened. But I'm sorry, that is not correct. It had nothing to do with the rooster because the cock crow was not a rooster. That word in Hebrew is a giver. Here it is in Hebrew. But guess what? The translation, this other word above means rooster. But that wasn't the Hebrew word. It was giver, which means a person, but it can also be a rooster. So what happened, for example, whenever there was a new moon or different things, there would be a priest in the temple who would light a lamp. And then you see in the far corner, the guy up high would light a lamp. And then pretty soon all around into Babylon, they would be lighting torches up on mountains. So everyone would know uh, when the festival began. Well, also, here we have the temple. There was a priest who would cry out, and he was called the rooster. There wasn't a rooster. It was a man. And he says, by the third time he crows, you will have denied me. Here's the phrases that he would cry every morning at sunrise. He would cry out, it is daylight. The whole eastern sky is lit. And then someone would ask him, as far as Hebron, and the second crow was, yes, as far as Hebron. And then the third calling was, arise you priests for your service, you Levites for your platform, and Israel for your post. It's time to start the morning service. That was the cock crow. It wasn't a rooster. They never allowed chickens and roosters in Jerusalem because who wants to have a slaughterhouse next to an outdoor church service? Everyone could smell. I used to live in Garden City, Kansas, and uh, IBP built this big you know, slaughtering house for beef. And man, for miles, you could smell the slaughterhouse. Well, they didn't want you smelling a slaughtering house of chickens. There never were chickens and roosters allowed in Jerusalem. So when it talks about the cockroach, it's talking about the priest who had the title of the rooster. Okay. This is from Easton's Bible Dictionary. He says, in our Lord's time, the Jews had adopted the Greek and Roman division of the night into four watches, each consisting of three hours, uh, the first beginning at six, and, and he goes through, uh, and then he says, but the ancient division known as the first and second cock crowing was still going on. Then, this is from ancient, ancient Jewish literature, what is the definition of a cock crow? It's the call of a man. The commencement of all services had to be heralded. And many heralds were employed. As a matter of fact, a man named Gabini was the herald in chief. His duty was mainly to call out in the morning 
priests to your duties, Levites to your chants, Israelites to your places. And then it says on festivals, when there were many sacrifices, Israelites would come very early and it was done at the first watch and before the cock crow and the temple court was full of Israelites. So when you read about the cock crow in the gospels, it had nothing to do with a rooster. It was a priest who had that title. Ta-da. All right, let's stand.